All right, we are live and I'm a little bit early. So if you are watching this video, just go ahead about, I don't know, five minutes and that's when the classroom will start. This is a private perk membership that I do on YouTube. I have a tier two classroom series if you're interested in joining us. It is really, I don't know, maybe 50 of us and the chat room is small. So I do a teaching video set up just like this, small chat room, answer questions. Today's video is all about pest management and it's part one. And if you're interested in perk memberships, go ahead and check out my, um, well, check out the video description, but go to my YouTube channel and just look for the join button. So this is gonna be public just so that I can kind of advertise that I'm doing this. So we are going to wait for people to sign in. Hi, Victoria. Hello, Gail. Um, we're so the members are signing in now and again if you want to get right to the content skip ahead about five minutes so I do about I don't know 150 public videos a year those are all still free and then I do have this perk membership and this is one of the perks we do I do two live classes this month for May this is disease and pest management part one and we're going to have disease and pest management part two later on for everybody signing on I mean typically we do this as a private video today is private the chat room is private it's all the same but I am going to launch this um, to the public um, followers on my YouTube channel just to kind of advertise this so if you want to be kind enough to just let people know if you find this valuable it would be great and what i've been trying to say to them is that with the perk membership it's just a small group so it's like a class i answer all the questions we go over different things um and it's pretty cool we'll start it's 11 30 we'll start in a couple of minutes just give people time to sign on and if you guys didn't catch the title for today it's disease and pest management planning part one so while we wait for people to come in, I am just going to set up the chat a little bit here so I can see it when we're, when I'm doing the class. And I do typically say, I'm assuming you guys can hear me and see me, but let me know if there's a problem. And I'm just popping out the chat here so I can connect everything together. So while we're waiting for more people to sign in, I'm going to do a video first. Usually I do a lot of small videos. I'm going to do a video that's about 10 minutes. I might stop in the middle, but it'll really kind of set the tone for today's classroom and the next classroom on pest and disease management. So while we're waiting a couple of minutes, Throw out any questions you have related to the topic or anything that's going on. I just, I don't want to get started and people are a little bit late and then they miss the video. So let's go with a little bit of Q&A or any questions from the last classroom or anything that's going on in your garden. I just came in. I finally have, probably looking out the window, 95% of my garden weeded. Hopefully by the end of this week, I am exactly where I want to be. Um, never quite get there, but you know, I should be pretty close. It's seven. It's 78 degrees here today. I checked the 10 day forecast. Looks like in Maryland at least. And I'm always surprised that California is having a tough time with colder weather this year. I think we're good to go in Maryland. Don't hold me to it. Every year I put out stuff and then the frost rolls in. But it looks like the next 10 days are fine. And we're going from 40 degree nights, 50 degree days for like the last seven days or so to really warm temperatures. So I'm in the process of taking care of all my lettuce, giving it away. I just had a friend come help me weed this morning before I started this. She took a bunch of lettuce. So the cool weather has been great for the cool crops. Everything looks good, but the heat is now rolling in and I'm going to really transition over to all the warm stuff. All right, we're gonna wait two more minutes and then we'll get started. Do I grow AM? Hey, Will, um, I don't think I've seen you come on before. Thanks for joining. I don't know what AM is. <laughs> Can you help me out with that? 
thistle is tough. Just a note, thistles grow the roots down and then they grow lateral roots. And even if you pull it out, it comes back, or at least some of the varieties. So in my garden, I know people hate this, the thistle was taking over. So I gently treated each thistle with some Roundup or like stuff just to target that plant, just a couple of drops. It actually wiped out most of that thistle and problematic thing without polluting my garden with crazy excess chemicals. The reason I say that is I'm like 95% organic. There may be a reason that I have to use something else to help out for whatever reason, and I don't want people to fear that. I understand 100% if you never want to touch something that is not organic, um, but I also don't want new gardeners to fear everything that is not organic. And there's a fine line between making personal choices of what you want to use in your garden. The reason I say that is when we get to pest and disease management, there are organic solutions, there are natural solutions, there are chemical solutions, and I'm going to be teaching people how to use them all or think about them all. And I'm not saying one or the other is better in this classroom. It's to educate you guys so that you can choose what you want to use in your gardens. Amaranth, that's what I thought you meant. I had just started growing amaranth. I actually have a new book coming out called, um, well, it's tentative, but it's How to Grow an Edible Landscape. And I think that's the title we settled on. It's going to come out in November. And part of it is using plants that people may not normally think of as food. Amaranth is one of them. It's become popular over the last years. The leaves are edible. The seeds are edible. I never get the seeds because... The animals usually take them. Um, but it is one plant that I'm scattering throughout my landscape beds to have amaranth available for eating. All right, we'll take the one more question, then we'll get started. I think I've seen those pesky lanternflies already. Has anyone heard any updates? Um, I don't have any updates. So one of the beauties of this um, perk live and these small groups is the people in this group are very smart. They offer a lot of help. There's not a lot to do. There's not a lot we can do for the lanternfly. I did read that they seem to be getting under control a little bit, but there's not a lot you can do. Some states want you to report them, but you know, th there isn't a whole lot that you can really do. All right, let's get started. And today's, the, so the two classrooms for May are managing pests and disease. This is part one. The second one, we're going to go into depth with the specific treatments, dusts, the organic sprays that I use, how to make them. Um, some of the things that you want to understand is like this is organic Captain Jack's dead bug dust. This is a dust that would go on leaves. This is specifically for killing insects. And even if you're using organic dust, it kills the good insects. So organic dust, chemical dust like seven, kills all insects. You have to use things in a targeted and strategic way, which is part of what I'll be talking about. So that's dust. This is rosemary oil. I sell this and peppermint oil at my shop. This is about three years old. It's almost done. I use this indoors, outdoors, depending on what problem I have. A little bit of oil goes a long way and I can see there's actually a hole in it. So that will be dropped over there. Hang on. I must have cracked it taking it out. So now I'm going to smell like rosemary all day. The organic oils are wonderful for taking care of Mexican bean beetles, spider mites, um, other problems, masking the scents of your plants to maybe keep the bad insects away. That's a strategy to use. And then I also like plain old hydrogen peroxide, which you can get. This is a 3% hydrogen peroxide. Get it at your grocery store, your pharmacy. I use this diluted down. I'll be going over the recipe next time. You can also find it on my YouTube channel. Just look look up tomatoes and hydrogen peroxide, you'll find the recipe. This cleans the leaves of my tomato plants, removes fungus and problems like that, and I've had great success using this for almost probably five years now. So those are just some of the products that you're gonna be able to use in the garden that we'll talk about. But what's really important is to understand that you're never gonna have a 100% success in managing down pests and disease. When you see gardeners talking about they have no problems, they have no issues, I guess it's true. 
but it's almost impossible. And it's like saying, you know, I don't have this bug attacking my garden, and it's because that bug's not available where I garden. It's not in Maryland. So take everything you hear about gardens that are pest-free, disease-free with a grain of salt. Everybody has a problem. The goal is not 100% perfection. It's to manage down the pests and the problems, the diseases that come to your garden, manage them down so you still get a beautiful harvest and your plants still do well. And that's what I'm going to be teaching about today. And again, I want to just stress, manage down the problem. Sometimes, for instance, you can eliminate the problem, but you might have three, four, five. So you never are like 100% perfect in the garden. You've just reduced things down. All right, let me check for questions real quick before we flip over to the video. Yeah, when I do this, um, Stacy, when I do the second part of the series, um, I'll also put them up on the camera to my side so that you can see them. And I will put them, you know, out into um, the YouTube community so that you can see them. I'm also finally getting to finishing up doing a ebook, just a, you know, a couple of pages on what we're talking about today. If that's something you wanted to pick up that eventually will be at um, my seed shop. I don't know why I forgot that, my garden and seed shop. As Perk members, I'll give you coupons when it gets there so that you can get it for free, but I'm gonna be selling that there for like five or six dollars. Now, <laughs> in saying that, don't hold me to it, that you know, if I get busy, it may not be done till the end of June, but I will put all the recipes out so that you guys can find them. Tiny Purple, have you ever grown spider lilies or something like that to help control pests? I hear they repel small critters, are poisonous, and are used for rat control in rice patties. I've never grown them before. Um, I'm not sure what they are. Uh, what I do say, and we'll be covering this, one option to managing down pests and disease is companion planting or planting different plants. Now, keep in mind, if it worked amazingly, we would have figured that out a hundred years ago, or at least let's say 20 years ago, and we would all be doing it. So there's not a single way to mix plants together to stop something a hundred percent, generally speaking, but you can help reduce it. Like maybe you chase away, in this case, 75% of the rats. That's a much better problem to have 25% rats than 100% and you know of course you got rid of 75% for instance if the tomato hornworm you know butterflies coming around or moth is coming around maybe your companion planting helps keep away half of them so you're reducing down the chances or the number of problems that you have in your garden so companion planting is one of the things that we'll be talking about all right so let's go into the first video it is 10 minutes long. I think I'm going to stop it at five minutes. It'll be somewhere around where I'm talking about spinach and I'll take questions. All right, let me get this set up here. Pest and disease management is gonna be broken up into two classes. All right, I'm holding it. So, all right, let's get started. This is the overview for today. Pest and disease management is gonna be broken up into two classes. Today's the first half. Second half is going to be about all the different sprays, different things you use on your garden, and kind of how do you apply them. What is most important is to understand that you can never 100%, generally speaking, stop all pests, stop all disease, stop, stop all problems. What you're really trying to do is manage down the damage so that you still get a great harvest and things look good. So never feel like you need to be perfect with no issues, it's just, it's just not gonna happen. Second thing, every garden is different. Each garden is gonna have its own problems, own diseases, pests, etc. And what do I mean by that? Yeah, we all might get early blight, but maybe I get it really bad in Maryland just because of the way the weather is. Or I get um, early blight in leaf spot, but I don't get late blight. And in a different state, different garden, you get late blight. And a lot of it's dependent on temperatures, humidity, different kinds of things. So I recommend, you know, researching what problems come to your area. Pests, insects, pests, 
deer, other animals, diseases, and also taking notes or taking photos of the problems that roll into your garden. This way you know when they show up because when we go to class two, prevention management is best done ahead of time and I'll explain more about that. I just want to do a quick walk through, talk to you about some of the things to keep in mind. So physical barrier, if you have deer, rabbits, other animals, you're going to need fencing usually, something like this four foot fence, yes deer can jump over it, but rarely they jump in there. I also had posts put in to come up to six feet that if I needed to put some wire or rope through here, I could raise the fence level because I wasn't sure how aggressive the deers would be. Deer also don't like to jump from the outside where it's wide open and land on here and possibly break a leg, just like people. So if you plant containers and stuff around the inside of your garden, they're not really gonna wanna try and make a leap all the way across. Other barriers, this is a 36 inch raised bed. Rabbits, groundhogs aren't gonna get to that. Yes, squirrels can get there, raccoons can get there. It'd be a perfect buffet for a deer to come and just drop its head in there. So you can also raise the bed and maybe you don't want a fence and maybe your only problem is, is uh, rabbits. So you have sort of this physical barrier that the rabbits can't get there. Also taking a look in here, you wanna be looking at the plants looking for damage. I'm going to stress over and over again. You don't want to come out and spray for one problem and then spray your lettuce when it doesn't need it. And then you think, oh, I've got this spray. I better cover my blueberry bushes. Only use your remedies, your sprays in a targeted way. You also have to look at the plants. Like this guy's pretty beat up, pretty beat up. You see all this. That is not from a pest or a disease. That's from cold weather we've been having. So you also have to try and identify problems on your plants and figure out if they're temperature related, nutrient related, we'll be doing other classrooms on that, or if it's a pest disease or something like that. So those peppers are fine and kind of how you know real quick is the outer leaves are all beat up, the new leaves are looking pretty good, as soon as it warms up these leaves will take over, all this will die off, plants are fine. I would be assessing my lettuces, no real holes in there, no slugs, no snails. We'll be getting to how I treat those um, in this video. And this video is gonna be a little bit longer for the classroom because there's so much information and I wanted to give you a lot of visuals. When I came down here, um, maybe two or three days ago, the lettuce head was all rotted and chewed out just like that. And the rest of the lettuce looks great, no other issue. I dug in here, found this long brownish red kind of look like a centipede. So I identified what the pest was. Sometimes you have to get down to the root, look around, see what's going on. And it was eating the you know main stem of the lettuce, probably laying eggs in there. Found it, killed it, took care of it. It's not spreading to my other lettuces. But you have to make sure you try and spend the time to figure out what actually is the cause of the damage. Other physical barriers we'll get to when we get down to the other side. Looking around again, looking at the leaves here, I was going back and forth. These are just too, it's too much damage for it to be, I think, leaf miner. So I think I just had some sort of snail or slug just chewing the soft side of the plant, eating whatever it does, causing a problem. I don't like dusting or spraying leafy greens. They're hard to wash. I don't want any chemical, organic or not, sprayed on them. I'm gonna teach you how to use the organic uh, chemicals and sprays and the chemical. All right, let's stop there for a second. Well, for a bit, and then we'll finish up the rest of the video in a little bit. So. I saw some good questions come up. Hang on to those. I'll be answering some of them. And at the end, I'm going to be asking for pests. And the question that um, was just put up there is when do you know when to quit? Um, I give them, let's just say you go full force. You see the problem. It got out of control. You're really working hard for a week to get them under control. If after a week doesn't go, Quitting is not the right word, it's another strategy and that's what I want you guys to be thinking about. Rather than trying to support a cucumber plant that's dying off or a squash plant that has a vine borer, have backup plants ready because these summer crops can be planted multiple times and they can be planted through disease cycles and insect cycles and they come out the other end towards the end of the summer producing really well. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
So let me just check real quick for questions. How do you determine brown spots from UV damage? UV damage is usually white and it's usually kind of bigger and faded and it just looks like the leaf has bigger patches of bleached out leaves. Spots, usually if they're small and brown and they have a yellow halo around it, that is an act of fungus. It's the brown spot with a yellow halo around it. Sun scald, sunburn doesn't look like that. It's just like bleached leaves. All right, so a couple of things. You have a, a, a selection of tools. You have the physical barrier, which I should, we just talked about in the video. You have sprays and dusts, which we'll get to in the second half of the video. Companion planting, baits and slugs, um, baits and traps. So there are different ways to manage the problems in your garden, and you're going to have to figure out what you want to use. Physical bar barriers are wonderful, but not everybody can afford that or able to do that. You have companion plantings. You can mix in garlic and onions and marigolds and other plants to help reduce damage from pests and disease. Some people have a strategy where they plant crops that the critters like somewhere else in the yard and they let them go to that and that helps reduce what's coming over to the main garden. Um, and then you have traps where I have kind traps to catch squirrels and then I release them five miles away. If I didn't do that, squirrels would just devastate through my garden. We have ridiculous amount. And then you have baits. You can have poison baits like you might use for ants that are getting into your garden. Not every ant is a problem. Um, or you have baits to kill slugs and snails. It's really up to you what you want to use. So you have a lot of different tools available. The most important thing is not to go and buy a little bit of every tool. It's really to learn the problems that are in your garden. You have to learn all of our gardens are different. We have different humidity, different temperatures. So you want to do some research. Find out what pests and disease may come to your garden. Talk to fellow gardeners. Talk to people at nurseries. Try and learn what comes to your garden. And you want to understand the cause because you're going to have to learn the difference between viruses attacking your plants, which is rare, fungus attacking your plants, pests attacking your plants, or nutritional issues, or like when you saw in the beginning, the pepper plant was really beat up by the cold weather and all that kind of stuff. Now, you're not supposed to know all of this before you start gardening. Give yourself a break, go slow and steady, and you will learn this over time. Your best friend is going to be keeping a journal, using pictures, using your phone, writing it down, combination of all of it, however you want to. But that's how you're gonna learn how to manage the problems down. If you are thinking of what you need to buy right now, make sure you don't overspend. If there was a cure that fixed every pest and disease, we would all know about it by now. So don't overspend on products that say they fix, you know, everything, including, you know, leaks in your kitchen or something like that. Be wise with your money. And you want to use whatever you buy in a very targeted way. You never want to go out there and you put some dust down, whatever you choose, on your cabbage. And then over there you see your tomatoes and you're like, I might as well hit that with dust. Or let me cover the blueberries. And then let me go over here. You can do so much damage to the good insects and to your garden by overusing, abusing treatments, be it organic, be it chemical. It's really important you have a plan, and that's what we'll be, we're talking about today. You should always have a purpose. If you have to use a strong chemical that you don't typically ever want to use, but you have this infestation of, say, 10,000 grasshoppers, maybe you have to use it. Learn how to use it in a targeted way. If you don't want to use chemicals, that's fine. Then you have to do some research, find the right organic match to work that out. But my point being is most of our stuff can be managed down with a plan organically. You could be in a place where some crazy infestation comes and you have to go to something strongly that you don't normally want to use. All I want to do is teach you what's available, whether or not you use it. That's up to you. Um, 
Any questions on that? Animals work too. I see Kim has a... Uh, so you have a dog. I have to consider my dogs inside the front yard, my other garden, as a pest because they are just crazily happy and insane and whip around the perimeter of the property. So I had to build cages to go around there, um, kind of like barrels, but they're cages, into my garden so that they will avoid them. If not, they were just tearing up all of my garden beds inside um, my fence area. And that's a good point too, is learning what the good bugs are. So every ant is not a problem. Every grub in your soil is not a problem. Um, every weird looking insect crawling on your cucumber leaves isn't a problem. And you do have to learn what are good insects, what are bad insects. And they vary greatly um, east coast to west coast, south to north and stuff like that. Um, learning them is a good idea. Learning that dusts organic or not kill everything is a better idea. So there's no such thing, again, I want to stress that you can put down a dust that's not going to kill your bees, your pollinators, your good insects, as well as the bad insect, insects. So you have to learn targeted ways to use it. And I'll be going over that in the second part and talk a little bit about that here. Any questions so far? This is kind of like kind of building the foundation. I mean, it's all going to boil down to really putting down on the calendar or your notebook or your phone that today is what is today today is may 7th walk your garden check it out you don't see any pests or problem because we're going to be talking about prevention and there's a specific way to do that i haven't found a good solution for ants we had aphids last year i bought ladybugs the ants kicked them out so ants I have, I make, so you have ants that eat proteins, you have ants that eat sugars, you have ants that eat roots of plants. I don't know which ones you have. If they're plants that like the sap and sugars and stuff like that, mixing borax and sugar together, putting it in a mason jar with some holes, they eat that, they die off. That works really well. You might want to go to the, you know, the baits that are more toxic but they're sitting on your garden. The ants crawl in there. They die off. They get it to the queen. It dies out. You remove them. Good to go. What I would do when you're using something like that that's more toxic is to not put them out when it's raining. You don't want water to get in there and wash it around. Just use them in a targeted way. Um, sometimes orange oil works. In It contacts the ants coating. You spray around the nest area. It, does, it kind of dissolves them and it, it breaks them down. But it's really important to know what type of ant you have because some things aren't going to work otherwise. Ladybugs are wonderful. I've tried that and they've hung around for two years. But sometimes you release ladybugs and you just watch them fly away and they, they're gone. So you have to have an ecosystem set up on your property for them to find a place to kind of overwinter and home and hang out. And I have a lot of perennial beds and, and places for that. Diatomaceous earth is a good tool. It is the silica. It's sort of the shells of microscopic organisms from oceans. You put that dust down, insects walk through it, gets into their joints, grinds down their shell, they dehydrate, and they die. Um, it is pretty benign in that the good insects would have to walk through it too. It will kill good and bad, but it's 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 not bad to use. Um, I'll be planting my peas, bok choy, and other cold crops. Last year they were bombarded by flea beetles. Can I do something to minimize the population before I plant? The answer is maybe. So I get flea beetles. I have videos on it. I get them on my eggplant. They will devastate my eggplant and my tomatillos. So if I don't use a dust, I've tried everything and... This is for like 20 years in both of my homes when I left my other home and came here. I have to put dust on the leaves and that kills them very quickly. Captain Jack's works really well. Seven dust is almost instantaneous. What I do with the dust is I put them on the leaves, 
let it go over the night, rinse it off during the day so it's not blowing around and getting to other good insects. Beetles are really active at night, so you can use a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about. You know, as darkness is approaching, get it onto the leaves, wash it off in the morning before the pollinator comes. But insect dusts work really well for flea beetles. If you wanted to get an organic dust, um, put it onto your ground, that would work. But they, I, I don't know where they come from, but they multiply really quickly. I found for them, it's like dust my eggplant, gets them under control. Seven to 10 days later, more dust down, gets them under control. And I have to kind of keep that going as my management pattern, pattern for eggplant because the flea beetles just have these voracious appetites. And if I miss a window, they repopulate, you know. All right. When you're using any sprays or dusts, um, I see diatomaceous earth, someone's talking about food grade. You can use either. I mean, even though it's not food grade, um, you wouldn't want to ingest it, but they don't really have that much more. If it's non-food grade, you can still use it. The worry is a little bit overblown, um, but you know, make that choice yourself. However, if it's food grade, maybe use diatomaceous earth and you harvest the next day and you don't really worry about it because people take food grade DE, they mix it into drinks, they use it in their bodies in certain ways for some reason, um, and that's okay to do. That being said, for that product, I harvest all of my crops that I'm going to treat with any spray, organic or not, even with peppermint oil, rosemary oil, anything that I'm putting down on my plants to manage pest and disease. Even if I'm, you know, putting down the hydrogen peroxide, even though I know this breaks down usually in 24 hours, you can just rinse off the fruit with water. I still do it after I harvest. So one thing I recommend is to continually look for the problems, identify when they're showing up, try and figure out what they are. But when you go to treat, Harvest what is harvestable so that you're not spraying and then two or three days you're trying to eat your lettuce or you're picking green beans or something like that. Take everything that you can, put the treatment down, and then you know, you're know you usually want that to be on there a good five or seven days before you go and harvest. Harvesting is all going to be based on the products that you're using, so I don't have a direct way to say this is safe or that's not safe. Just kind of, you know, be wise about what you're you're using. For instance, I don't um, spray anything on my spinach, my leafy greens, because they're too hard to wash. Organic or not, they just are left alone. That's why my spinach kind of looks a little bit beat up. I'm not going to really dust that because I'm going to be eating it in some capacity. And it's not like you necessarily harvest spinach and then you wait seven days. I'm always taking leave. So you want to know how you eat from your garden, how you harvest from your garden, and then you want to have a plan on how you're putting the uh, treatments out into there. All right, let me check for questions. When I do my ebook, do you mind putting the time frames to reapply? Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about time frames today too. It just varies a lot. So in doing this, I'm kind of going over what works for me and you're going to be building a plan around you know, the basic information that I gave you. And I want to, well, we can do the second half of the video next, but I just want to stress again too, trying to really learn the problem and it's overwhelming because when you first start, you might like see things on your leaves and then you go to a Facebook group and you describe what you have and they tell you it's 15 different things and six different remedies. Um, don't don't overwhelm yourself with trying to know everything. You're going to have main issues, flea beetles, cucumber beetles, maybe early blight, maybe some sort of powdery mildew. Everything that's on a leaf isn't necessarily a problem, so don't feel like you have to explore and figure out what everything is. Give yourself a year if you're a new gardener take notes, you're going to see the main problems roll in and you begin to address those and then you learn about what some of the other stuff is. 
And I think it's really important too to say at this point that if I give you a spray formula, like maybe it's two tablespoons, two teaspoons, I've just made a mistake, two teaspoons of pepper and, peppermint oil in a gallon of water. Works great for me. Works great for everybody on here, but um, Gail decides to use it. She sprays all of her crops that have the issue that peppermint spray or rosemary spray helps and it damages them. Sometimes that happens, I don't know why. So you always want to test spray new sprays by spraying a couple of leaves, really waiting 48 hours and seeing if that does any damage. Now, when the weather is cooler versus when the weather is really hot, the same spray could cause damage. So you do have to learn you know, what sprays you're using and when to use them. Yeah, and plant and replace um, is a good way to take care of problems too. That's also really, it is kind of a totally organic way to do it. You get the diseases that come in, you get your harvest from your squash and zucchini, powdery mildew comes in, you maybe don't want to spray anything. You remove the plants, you wait for the powdery mildew two week period you know, to go away, you put in new transplants and you've just planted around it. There's a lot of different strategies. Yeah, you can get bad advice. Um, well, you can get bad advice from me. You can get kind of group think advice where everybody's trying to help and it just overwhelms the person. All right, so we got the test spray, which is really important. And don't, don't treat everything. The other thing that happens when you're new or when you're worried is some diseases and some pests only stay to one plant. So please don't feel you have to dust your cucumber plants to manage the cucumber beetles. And then you wanna dust your tomato plants that are right near it, and then you want to dust your pepper plants. Like I have very few problems of things coming to chew tomatoes and peppers, but I have cucumber beetles that love cucumbers. The way you address them, I'm going to ask at the end, but I'll just cover it now, is you put the insect dust for cucumber beetles on the outer leaves of the cucumbers, cucumber plants, away from the flowers, so good pollinators and such don't get, you know, the dust on them. I do it in the evening. In the morning I come out, I will find dead cucumber beetles. Captain Jack's Organic Works, seven works. It's a little bit faster. You will find the dead cucumber beetles. At night, they're super hyperactive. They crawl everywhere. You're putting the dust on outer leaves. They're crawling around. They die off. And you just stick to a routine with that. It works, it works really well. All right, so let's do the second part of the video. And... Give me a second because I'm going to have to reset it at five minutes when, we, when I started here. Pest and disease management is going to be broken up into two classes. Today's the first half. Second half is going to be about going all the different sprays. Over here to five. Damage. Found again, looking at the leaves here. I was going back and forth. Could These are just two. In a second here. All right. Causing a problem. We'll pick it up from here. I don't like dusting or spraying leafy greens. They're hard to wash. I don't want any chemical, organic or not, sprayed on them. I'm going to teach you how to use the organic uh, chemicals and sprays and the chemical types. It's up to you to decide what you want to use in your garden. You can see that same pattern on here. I thought it might have been like leaf miners, but probably snails and slugs. Also, you want to keep harvesting mine. If you were to spray, say, your spinach. At this point, I know that I'm going to be chopping this all up and using it in the next couple of days. I wouldn't want any sprays on there. So you have to have a strategy on harvesting. One of the main things to do is come out to your garden, harvest everything that you want, then put your sprays down because you're more likely to not come out to the garden for more food. Give it five days, seven days for your treatments to do the trick. I'm working on so come March, what I'm working on is managing snails and slugs. And a lot of times when you see holes like that, that's exactly what it is. I've left the spinach go because I'm not really taking care of it right now. But I have to put down slug bait early in March, every month. It's made a huge difference because if not, when I get down to the lettuces, they would be all chewed up. So I've learned what I have to do to treat my plants. To manage pests and disease, and I, you know, keep a list. I'm starting to put in garlic and stuff like that. That's great for pest management, 
but companion planting if it resolved issues with pests insects worms coming into your garden we would all know what exactly it is and every garden would be perfect it helps it manages down the problem got some fertilizing issues in here with the broccoli this broccoli is going to be uncovered um, it's going to be treated with dust i recommend so we have like the baits that you put down we're going to have sprays i get containers sprayers this is a gallon sprayer i get usually what's on sale and i write the recipe right on there we'll be talking more about the recipes again in the second one and this way like i know peppermint oil rosemary oil can stay longer in a container and that's what i'll do i'll just leave it in there longer certain things like neem oil you really want to use that within 24 hours so you have the sprays the other method to control both diseases and pests are dusts. The one on the left is a chemical um, made by people. The other one is organic, made by people, but comes from nature, so it's considered organic. It would go on the leaves. Thing to remember about dusts is that they are non-discriminate killers. They'll kill good insects and bad insects. For instance, broccoli, it is not forming the crowns yet. I would use dust perfectly fine on here. Leaves are thick, wash them off, etc. I use what I'm comfortable with. But if I had a big crown, I wouldn't want to be getting dust or spray in there because that's going to be hard to wash. So you want to be thinking about how you use your sprays or your dusts when it comes to harvesting and eating the food. All right, so let's talk one more. Uh, let me give you one more physical barrier. So I have that white moth that comes, that white butterfly that comes. It's been around, starts laying eggs on here. This damage, for instance, is from the weed eater. <laughs> when I was treating the, uh, cutting the weeds back, pieces of wood would fly in and damage them. So you want to know what the damage is, you know? So the damage here was me. So that you're not running around trying to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed. So the white butterflies flying around, landing on the leaves, lays the eggs for the uh, cabbage worm, damages the plants. We could put dust down, that would work. We could do a physical barrier, that would work. But we just have to know when these problems are showing up. You also have problems, the pests, the diseases, some might just be around for a week. Conditions are right for a week. Some might be around for a month. Conditions are right that the pest, the disease keeps showing. Some all season long, like that white moth. I always say moth because I just hate it. It's a white butterfly. It's around from really April all the way into October till the frost comes. So anything that I would grow in the brassica family is going to get that white butterfly laying eggs on it. This is a physical barrier. There's kale in there. This will keep the white butterfly off. It's a large butterfly. Part of the strategy you're thinking about is what is the pest? Big butterfly not gonna get in here. If there's a little gap at the bottom, smaller moth might get in. That's how I got white flies in there. So if you're going to use a barrier, you got to make sure it stays protected the whole time. Like it is possible the moth, I believe it's a moth, that uh, lays the eggs for the white flies could get right into there. If you're putting a barrier down, say maybe when the plants are this big because you just see the um, white butterfly come in, you have to make sure, like there's some insects that came out of there, you have to make sure you dust or you spray or you manage the kale in there as if it has an egg or a problem on it. So anything that might have been laid on there isn't going to hatch when you put the barrier over it and then everything's going to just go crazy. So if you're using a barrier, you got to make sure the plants you're covering are clean from pests and disease. So we have physical barriers, fence, ag fabric like I showed you, a higher sided raised bed. We have sprays, we have dusts, those are all things that we can use to manage problems. We have the bait for snails and slugs, which I like and I need in my garden. I just scatter that around as soon as it begins to warm away from the food. You don't, even, you don't want to pile it like around your food. You don't want to put it on your leaves. Just in all different places where you're not eating from, snails and slugs find it because it's baited. It kills them off. Things are looking pretty good. Coming out of spring, into summer here in Maryland, there's usually few problems. For me, snails and slugs again, white butterfly rolls in, maybe leaf spot, 
because of the cold temperatures. Um, if I had my tomatoes out, that becomes a problem. But in the next three day, three days, three weeks, four weeks, all the issues are gonna be rolling in. So I need to have my prevention plan and my management plan in place. And that's what we're gonna really talk about today. But wanted to give you an overview of some of the tools and things to think about when you're building the plan to, to protect or best manage your garden. All right, any questions on that? One of the things is, that is important, and um, Kim was saying he's transitioning over from one cover to another cover. You wanna make sure if you're putting any barrier over your plants that you're not gone even for an hour because that moth or that butterfly, I said moth again, can come and lay eggs on there or an insect can get into your plant. So when you're putting the ag fabric, you could also use tool. That's just something you buy um, at fabric stores. Tool is wonderful. It does work. I've used it before. It has no ultraviolet protection. So you set it up, the sun beats down on it for a season and it really decays. So it, it only has really about one or two years worth of use, depending on how long it's staying out in your garden. You can um, get the ag fabric, which is a little more pricey, but it has some sort of protection or it just doesn't degrade and you can use it year after year. So we kind of did the overview with the idea of identify, take notes, here are the products that are available. So one of the things I wanted to say is with the dusts and sprays, you have sprays, dusts that work on insects, and then you have them that work on fungus. So powdery mildew is a fungus. Um, cucumber beetles, obviously a pest. The same dusts don't work on either. So on fungi or funguses, <coughs> excuse me you might use a sulfur dust you might use a baking soda spray you're using things that change the ph level on the leaves and it stops the fungus from taking hold let's talk about um, one again throw out some questions and then i want to talk about how often you use these sprays because this is what i get often and it's hard to kind of figure out so it does take some time to learn All right, question, Jolene, does the insect fabric have to go to the ground and be sealed? Good question. If you're using the egg fabric, and this is so important to know what you're targeting. So if you're using egg fabric to keep the white butterfly away, it doesn't have to go all the way to the ground. The butterfly really doesn't necessarily want to crawl through there and go up, but other insects might do that. So if it's for white flies or maybe aphids or something, you probably want it sealed. Also, you have to know what the insect does. So the white butterfly will land on the leaf. It tries to go on the underside of the leaf, but it will lay eggs anywhere. If your egg fabric is laying on the leaf and the butterfly just doesn't really figure out something's there, it can still lay eggs sometimes through there. Very rare, but it could happen. So if you're using fabric you want to make sure it puffs out and goes around the leaves and none of the leaves are touching or out from the bottom. You could have a gap in the bottom, which isn't so bad, but if you have maybe lower kale leaves sticking out, that's all you need for that white butterfly to come and land. So it just, just also depends on what you're protecting things against. Rhododendrons, I don't know. Copper fungicide is really good um, I would probably ask locally or try and, and figure out what it might be, but um, copper spray, and this is why, just a side note, so we spray copper on the gardens to manage grapes and different fungus and diseases. Copper treated, pressure treated wood, people say, don't use it, you're going to poison yourself. The copper compound isn't exactly the same, but it's still copper being spread around. And the reason that we don't worry about it that much is because we need a certain amount of copper in our bodies and you need really high amounts of copper in a plant to ingest it to poison yourself. And by the time it got to that level in the plant, 
the plant would have already died off, so we're not going to be eating it. So you just kind of sometimes want to use your own logic and experience over time that why is pressure treated wood feared, but a copper spray isn't. And a copper spray has been used as in a Bordeaux spray, but I think it's like lime and copper in France to treat all the grapevines because there's a problem coming in and they found a great solution to it. We don't worry about copper that way. All right, so, and I, I think too, um, Rooted Heart, that you have a rust. There's different varieties of rust. You've tried copper um, fungicide. It's not working. Um, the temperatures have been odd in California. Don't know if it's odd in your area. Sometimes these problems don't exist when our, nor our weather patterns stay the same. But then we get these freak two week periods of extra cold, of extra rain. When that happens here, like if all my tomatoes were out and this cold period rolls in, you know, not quite frost, but cold, rain is around, leaf spot takes over. If I don't get that period, it doesn't show up. So it's also kind of paying attention to weather patterns around your area. All right, so here's what I do. I'm trying to figure, I'm looking at A, B, C, and D here on how often you use your intervention. Your intervention could be spray, could be dust, could be hand picking, it could be anything. You start with trying to learn when the problem shows up in your garden. And when you have that date, you start your intervention, usually a spray or a dust, two to four weeks early because you're covering the leaves so that the powdery mildew doesn't set in. You're putting down dust so the flea beetles, as soon as they show up, they're killed off. So prevention about two to four weeks ahead of time. You know, four weeks is a little bit overkill, but you know, if you're going to do that and you really want a clean garden, maybe that works for you. So now that you started the prevention, you can really probably go every 10 to 21 days, depending on what the problem is, to keep up that prevention or keep up that maintenance. And you just keep interrupting potential life cycles of the fungi or the diseases of the pests. And that really manages the problem down. If you're doing that and you're not sure, like when powdery mildew shows up or something like that, um, you know, like I said, that range is pretty good. If you know that powdery mildew is July 1 through July 31st, that's the active period. Maybe every 10 days you're doing the prevention and you increase the prevention or the intervention more frequently when you know that insect is around, that disease is around, and this way you're kind of upping how frequently you're putting down the countermeasure. All right, let me pause there because that was a lot of information. Any questions on that? I agree. I think gardening is going to be a challenge because the temps are just all over the place, um, which gives life to insects. Here's a good example. If my winters are cold enough, for a long enough period, we get a whole lot less of those white butterflies and less insects coming in. When it's somewhat mild, everything, more grasshoppers, more whatever, come out and it is more of a problem. For fungus, if you know, you're know you in a place maybe you don't have a lot of humidity and you don't get maybe powdery mildew so much or you don't get a disease that's more liking the humid air but all of a sudden the humidity starts going up in your area you're going to have this influx of a new fungus that you probably never had to deal with so getting out into the garden and just observing and taking notes is really really important for prevention all right i forgot to look no questions okay so Let's go with an outbreak. So say, and this happens to me still, you know, you can't be out there checking every 
day to see what's going on. Maybe you go away for the weekend, which you deserve, or you go away for a week, you come back, um, and you have this outbreak of flea beetles. Your, your eggplant are just devastated. Or you have aphids everywhere. That's when it becomes what I call an infestation. And a question that we had earlier is, when do I quit? And I want to kind of rephrase that. You're not really quitting or giving up. You are putting a management plan together to say, damage plants, give you seven days of hope, 10 days of hope. After that, I'm not going to waste my time and resources. I'm going to get my transplant in or I'm going to plant some new seeds. So that being said, got an outbreak of aphids. I hit it with soapy water spray or I hit it with uh, a horticultural oil, whatever you want to choose. And oh, let me make a note here. This is going to be important. Hold on. That's for the end of the lesson. You hit it. And then you're not going to wait 10 or 14 days because you have the active fungus, you have the adult insects, but then you also have fungal spores, you also have eggs, and you have an infestation. So I usually, again, will treat the plant sometimes as early as three days later, you know, but definitely within five to seven days, you want to hit it again with an application. So you're trying to kill off the problem that's on the leaves, also interrupt the life cycle, kill out any new spores that are doing their thing or any eggs that are hatching. And you might have to do that, you know, every, whatever, let's just say five days. So you spray, you wait five days, you spray, you wait five days, you spray. You might have to do three cycles or something to get it under control. If the plant's responding, the problem is going away, the plant is coming back, you leave it. If not, you know, I pull it out. I always try and treat white flies. If they get too much out of control, I yank everything because they are just really hard to control here in Maryland. I can manage them down, I can do okay. And I will do that to get the harvest. And then after that, those plants are gone and new plants go in. I actually do have a garden journal. I don't know if I can find it from here in this mess of my office. Um, yeah, I have a journal. It says the rusted garden on it. It's red. It has a plastic cover. It's just notebook paper. And you can find it at my seed and garden shop. And I like the plastic cover because if it gets wet, it doesn't kind of warp and all that kind of stuff. But any journal will work. And it's small. I mean, you know, I just carry it around with me. I, it actually sits out in one of my sheds and I just make notes on there. Um, and Gail has a good point too, is prevention is looking around for weeds and places the insects like to hang out or overwinter, removing them, removing, you know, a uh, board that may be laying down. That could be where all your snails and slugs go. Squash bugs are hard to kill off. I'm not even sh necessarily sure dusts kill them. Um, even seven dust, which is like my emergency dust if things are out of control. Um, I don't know if that works. Uh, I do a lot for squash bugs by checking the undersides of the squash leaves. And when I see those orange, you know, metallically looking eggs, um, I remove them. I might, sometimes I carry neem oil with me in a Q-tip and I just put the neem oil on the eggs. It will damage the leaf. It'll burn a hole in the leaf, but it kills off the eggs. All right. So the note that I wrote down here, and if you want to ask me questions about the spray routines, that's a great time. Um, we're almost to 1230. We'll spend maybe 10 minutes. Also, if you want to throw out a pest or a problem that comes to your garden, I can tell you a little bit how to treat it. And then next time we do part two, we'll be really going into the recipes. So, you know, we have like physical barriers, sprays, dusts, oils, um, baits, uh, companion planting. There's not one product, like for me, let me rephrase it. So I use Captain Jack's dust, backup seven dust. I use neem oil spray for certain things. I use peppermint oil, rosemary oil, slug baits. Those are my, my main tools. I have a fence, physical barrier. I have ag fabric, physical barrier. I have traps to remove 
uh, squirrels and then I release them. I don't harm them. I have my strategy. All those things are useless if I don't have my plan in place. It doesn't matter. I have neem oil and rosemary oil and all this great organic stuff. If I'm not spraying a couple weeks before the problem arise, arrives, if I'm not spraying every 10 to 7 or every 10 to 14 days, if I'm not making my soapy water spray and hitting the aphids when I see them or smashing them with my fingers on a routine, then none of these things work. And that's what I want to stress for the end of this video. It's not the products that you buy. It's not whether you're 100% organic version of, I don't think anybody's 100% chemical, somewhere in between. It's your routine and learning your garden and the problems and then just sticking to a plan. And maybe it doesn't work. I also want to stress now as we're concluding that maybe you can't do every five, seven days inspect the garden. You can only inspect every 14 days because you got a job and you got a life. That's fine too, but you just don't want to miss that 14th day and have it turn into 21 days. So you can only get out every 14 days. You're only spraying every 14 days. That's what works for you. That will lower the damage and problems a good amount. So it's really sticking to whatever plan you set up. And each garden is going to be a little bit different. All right. So soap, let's go with that. So a lot of times you'll see, and this is the reason you want to test spray. And this is probably a great example. Thank you, um, Stacy. You might see two tablespoons of soap in a gallon of water. Mix it up, spray. If you're using this Castile type soaps, which are the pure soaps, they're not detergents, they have no additives, they're not dish detergents, they're not what you use at your sink. They are just these pure, milder soaps that you wash and it takes germs and dirt off your hand. You can almost get away with a two tablespoons of Castile type soap in a sprayer and spray aphids in your plants and most of your plants will be fine. If you go to one tablespoon, I haven't found anything that the Castile damages, but you still would want to test spray. If you get that spray information and you go and use your Dawn dishwashing soap detergent, which is concentrated so that you only need one drop instead of 10 drops, and you do a teaspoon of that, that is going to damage the leaves in your garden. You could use a teaspoon of that detergent. Um, there's also versions of dish detergents or soaps and you know there's soap and there's detergent but we intermix that in our language and how we see it so people do get confused so you want to learn what sort of detergent or soap or combination of degreaser and soap and etc gets confusing you're using so that you don't over <laughs> soap up your spray so one strategy I would say is if you're unfamiliar, you don't know, gallon of water, one teaspoon of the soap or detergent you're using, mix it up, test spray, see how that goes. Doesn't work well, go to two teaspoons. Doesn't work well, go to one tablespoon. And what you're doing is, is you're slowly building up your knowledge base and you're finding what product works best for you in a way of soap or detergents. And then when you get to that right recipe, write it down. That's what you use for your garden. I'm going to check for questions real quick. I know I saw one for tomato hornworms. So I didn't answer your question. So um, Urban Chicken Mama, it is okay to use any soap, any detergent, but the concentration of how much you use per gallon is going to vary. And that's what you have to learn and figure out. Tomato hornworms, they are, I, I've only seen a couple in my garden, which is good. Um, I spray hydrogen peroxide spray on my tomato plants. That doesn't really stop insects. It's more for cleaning the fungal issues that I get. 
So if you get tomato hornworms, that would be the time that you want to be putting dusts on your leaves a week, two weeks before because they have to you know, lay eggs, hatch, and become the hornworm. And the hornworm goes crazy, and you're right, it can devastate down your tomato plant quickly. So knowing when they're showing up, you can go out with a, a, yeah, a fluorescent or a black light flashlight. They kind of reflect this cool color. You remove them. You kill them off. By hand, it kind of works really well for them because their life cycle is different. It's not like the moth or the butterfly, again, the butterfly that lays the cabbage worm that's around for six months here in Maryland. There's a specific life cycle for the hornworm. So if you know it, you can go out more often, look for it, hand pick it, get rid of it, or you can dust and take care of it. All right, so we're going to end there. Um, for the next class, if you want supplies, a gallon pump sprayer is great. If you have a bigger... So I use a gallon pump sprayer, like for, say, the peppermint oils for managing cucumber uh, beetles. I'm sorry, for managing mites on my cucumber plants, Mexican bean beetle, spraying peppermint oil to mask the scents of my plants. Like one gallon seems to work well. If I'm doing a spray for fungal control, I like the two gallon container and maybe my mix is um, two gallons of water, two to four tablespoons of baking soda and I have a lot of cucumbers, pumpkins and melons that day, that whatever garden year. I don't wanna have to keep refilling one gallon so I like to make two gallons. It's enough to soak everything down, stems, ground, underside of the leaves, top side of the leaves, hits all of my targeted plants and I don't have to keep refilling it. So you want to keep you want to keep in mind what do you need? A gallon container maybe for peppermint oil, um, a two gallon for maybe a baking soda spray. Maybe you have some harsher spray you want to use that you don't want to contaminate your oils with. So you want to keep that separate for infestations where maybe you use like a seven dust liquid or something like that, which I don't necessarily recommend because if that contacts any insect, it kills them. So it's it's not the best. That's why I choose to use seven dust on outer leaves because I'm keeping it away from pollinators and problems if I decide to use that. So you have to think about that too, is how many containers you want, etc. what you're going to put on it. I write all my recipes like you saw on the containers. Then I don't have to remember them, I don't have to find the books, and I have separate containers. You also want to think about what works for you. If you set up something really aggressive, like every seven days I'm going to spray and do this, you're going to feel defeated if you can't do that, and I can't do that, and I'm lucky enough to have more free time to focus on my garden. So you want to have a management plan that you put in place that you can achieve. And even though you might feel like you got to do something every seven days with sprays, if you can only do it every 14 days, but you stick to that plan every 14 days, you're going to reduce the problems down in your garden. All right. Any last questions? I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover for today. I'm just checking my notes here. Oh, one thing I did miss. So if you are using ag fabric and maybe you have no problems to start and you're using the ag fabric, it looks good. You still want to get in there, you know, on a routine, look on the undersides of the leaves and catch anything that might be starting because something could sneak into there. So you don't want to be surprised when you're like, hey, things are going good. You leave them alone for 14 days, you come back and it's filled with white flies. So even though you're using physical barriers to keep insects out of certain crops, you do want to go in and check them out. All right, I think we will end there. You guys have a great Sunday. I'm gonna go back out into the garden between thunderstorms. It's so crazy, like slow, cold rain, seven days. Now we're getting 
you know, the thunderstorms we get here in Maryland, and it's actually almost 80 degrees. Yeah. You had tree covers one year. How did that work? So the, the ag fabric that you saw in the video is actually my tree cover, and it really worked well, you know. Um, tree covers I might use again to put on and keep birds and squirrels from getting to my food, um, to my fruit. Um, it helped. I mean, I used it when the cicadas were around and we just had thousands of cicadas and they could get in and fruit trees got really messed up. But now you see those tree canopies, the ag fabric are perfect domes. And in that, um, circular raised bed that I have, I use the, um, mesh fabric, the brick fabric to kind of create a rainbow. And I just put these domes over them and it works really, really well. So I'm getting to reuse them. If you are looking for ag fabric, the tree canopies work really well. Some of them have zippers too, so it's easy to get into there, but you just build, you know, a canopy frame and you just drop the ag fabric over it. It worked really well. All right, you guys have a great day. I think we'll end there. And remember that you really want to just figure out a plan that addresses the top problems that come to your garden and one that works for you. Don't overbuild your plan because I am, probably you guys are, going to be a little more tired out when the heat comes, the plants are big, the problems are rolling in, and you're better off having a routine that you can manage than one, you know, feeling like, oh, I didn't do this or I got to get out there. Like we don't want to burn out either. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Next time. So one more thing. So you got the sprayer. Think about your sprayer. I would pick out some sort of dust. And maybe this is kind of for the next class. Pick out the insect dust that you might want to use. Captain Jack's works. Seven dust works. Treat them both as poisons to all insects, whatever you pick. Um, neem oil, I like to use for chewing insects. You can get BT, that's a um, biological control for chewing insects. Um, you mix that into the sprayer. For antifungal, baking soda does work. Sulfur dust works. You put down sulfur dust on the leaves, changes the pH of the leaves. So start thinking about some of the products that you might want to have to kind of create your arsenal, but don't overbuy. Kind of think what diseases come to my garden, what pests come, and what are the main things you want to use. Learn how to use them well, and then put your plan in place. All right, I will see you guys next time. Oh, so I don't have it with me, but I think if you go and check out um, the agenda for May, the next event is how to create a garden YouTube channel, which I think will be a lot of fun. That's all for the perk members too. Um, I think it's on Tuesday, but check out either go to the Facebook group, um, the rusted garden homestead, the uh, syllabus is up there for May pinned or go to the YouTube, my YouTube channel, check the community. But I hope to see you guys um, for the discussion on the YouTube channel and bring all your questions. I will go over it with you and we should have a lot of fun.